Dear brothers and sisters in the International Ministerial Congress of the Church of God's Seventh Day, members, supporters, leaders around this world, I greet you in the brotherly love of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. I'm speaking an English paraphrase on behalf of our President of the International Ministerial Congress, our beloved Ramon Ruiz. I speak also on behalf of the International Ministerial Congress throughout the world, as well as on behalf of the zone representatives, the seven zone representatives around this world. And I deliver on this special Sabbath, the International Ministerial Congress annual Sabbath, this special day, warm greetings to emphasise and to recognise the work beyond our national borders. As many of you know, for several years now, at the international level, we've had an agreement that on the first Sabbath of every November, we take time to remember the characteristic work of God is the universal work of the church in sharing the gospel. And so the, the word says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So just as the, the gospel is universal, we are universal in sharing that message. And it's also important to remember that the good news, the gospel, overcomes every barrier. Barriers in the literal sense that divide communities otherwise in this world. Barriers such as racism, classes, ethnicity, status, socioeconomic barriers, all of these are part of the human condition and experience without Christ. But by the grace of God in Christ, we are one body in Christ. For in Christ, there's no Jew nor Greek, male or female, bond or free. We are all one in Christ. And all those barriers that divide have been overcome. Moreover, brothers, let us remember that in the eyes of God, we are all of equal value. We are a community of equals in God's eyes, but we have different functions, depending, of course, on the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God gives us. But in the eyes of God, we are equal. So this Saturday on the 5th of November, we have a very meaningful message, a theme message that's deep, beautiful and meaningful, and it's titled, Accompanied by Jesus. And it suits very well because we are overcoming and we're coming out the other end of the pandemic phenomenon. And we're also seeing not only health crises, but other crises happening throughout the world. We are recognized after two or three years of pandemic, we have lost brothers and sisters. And this has been a painful experience for many. But having coming out what we believe to be the other end of that, we, by the grace of God, and have a certainty that through wherever we go, we are accompanied by Jesus. And that's why the theme of this IMC celebration is so important. We must remember that Jesus says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age. And that is very powerful because I want to now, as Ramon Ruiz has, share a portion of scripture that exemplifies this from the book of Revelation. As you know, this book is somewhat enigmatic for many because of the type of literature that it is. It's a book full of symbols. And as we read those symbols, by the grace of God, we understand by the Spirit, we can make a correct interpretation of the symbols that appear in the book of Revelation. And I want to read Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through the verses 20. And then, then through those verses, I'm going to make a little bit of commentary about it to emphasize the purpose and detail in order to strengthen our faith, to remain strong wherever we live, to be people, to be people who genuinely persevere no matter what lies in the future, and to maintain the effort to be a faithful church, in other words, to be the church that God expects us to be. Listen to carefully as we go through the words in this book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me 
a voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands was one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs on his head were white, like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was shining like the sun in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven golden st- seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And we can look at that and go, Amen, brothers and sisters. Well, I'd like to begin, first of all, to say that this vision to John was the first beginning stage set in the book of Revelation. And it means a lot because Revelations 1, 2, and 3 sets the stage and holds a certain primacy in the Revelation narrative. And in that sense, those words give us some hope and comfort and encouragement in the difficult times now and what we may have to face in the future. Right now we see several armed conflicts happening in the world around us where our brothers and sisters as a result are suffering and many have had to leave their homes in order to save their lives. There are many scourges in this world and many of those scourges affect a lot of countries around the world. So brothers and sisters, historically, then in the past or today, by God's grace, we are not alone. We as God's people have always been accompanied by Christ. And that's the theme of today as we celebrate and proclaim the Lordship of Jesus being with us around the world now and on into the future. And so I want to go a little bit deeper into this reading and share and encourage you to remain strong and steadfast in the faith in and of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Now, Looking at the author of the scripture, he identifies himself as John, and he does not give his credentials as an apostle, much like Paul does and others do as well. Now, we don't know whether he was John the apostle or not. John was a common name at the time, but we just know he was a servant of God named John, and because John was a very common name in the first century, and I've inherited that name, John, from my Greek grandfather. What is important above the writing is above the writer, is the writing recorded for us from 2,000 years ago. That is, as we are before and we immerse ourselves in the Word of God, the author identifies himself as our brother, that we are not alone in this kind of tribulation and neither was he. You see, there's millions of Christians around the world who are suffering, experiencing some kind of marginalization, cancel culture, having to flee for their homes. And the one thing that we all share in common is that we're not alone. Since the beginning of Christianity, followers of Christ have suffered various tribulations. And whether it's been in the past or in the future, we know that in a broken world, that's what we can expect. So the author says that apart from being our brother, he's also a participant in tribulation. What did Jesus say? In this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so the patience of our Lord Jesus Christ finds John exiled on the Isle of Patmos. Now you know that in the Roman Empire, it was customary to banish those who posed any threat to the stability of the empire. Now, Jesus Christ himself was crucified 
uh, with the consent of the Roman authorities because they were, were afraid of political revolt under their tenure. And so also we see this kind of edginess, whether it's the narrative in the Sanhedrin. We also see the disciples. They inherited suffering in the name of Jesus. And today we are no different that we face our lot of suffering in this world. Why? For the sake of faith, because we put the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So John, 2,000 years ago, was exiled from his, on this island. Now, it wasn't an island paradise as we might imagine in the Pacific of the Indian Ocean, some place of luxury. It was, rocked, it was rocky, it was cragged, it was inhospitable. And so John, as well as presumably others, were exiled to a place like that. So they could no longer share the good news. They could no longer be about their pastoral duties. And so the apostle says he was taken there by the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that gives the authority to the narrative that follows. And it's in the midst of suffering that we can go through that we can actually, when you think about suffering, there are two levels of suffering. One is self-inflicted suffering, and others is in, if suffering from an external source. And of course, sometimes we know we can be our own worst enemy with delusions of grandeur, or we focus on material things and, and, and we can't get them, and so we suffer in that capacity. What we have to look at is the cause and the origin of our suffering because too often we are responsible for our own actions and we've fabricated the cause of suffering through our failure to walk with the Lord. And, of course, there's no glory, there's no merit in that. So we must look and recognize whatever we're suffering, where does it come from? Does it come from our own ineptitude or does it come from an external source, the brokenness in this world? For the sake of the gospel, as in the case of John, it was for the glory of God. What does Jesus say? Blessed are they when they persecute you for my name's sake. Because God gets the glory. And you read in the early chapters of Acts where the disciples were felt it was glad to be counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. And that legacy that Jesus says, I will build my church. Suffering is woven into the very fabric of our journey in this world. So back to John. He was carried away in a spiritual vision on the day of the Lord and he hears a voice saying, I'm the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And so John is instructed to write a letter to the seven churches who are located in Asia Minor, where Turkey is today. And we can histor historically verify those cities that John wrote to. And the voice in this vision is easily identifiable as the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to us. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, using a play on the alphabet, as was understood in that day. This is very significant because the idea of Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, referring to deity, the Son of God glorified at the right hand of the Father, appears also later on in the book of Revelation. So what does John hear? He hears a voice. And he turns to see the voice that spoke to him and he sees seven golden candlesticks and in the middle of the seven golden candlesticks is one that he recognises as being like the Son of Man. Now it's interesting, this vision, this right at the very beginning, the Son of Man is of course the Lord Jesus Christ manifest to John in glory. And he's in the middle of the seven candlesticks. He's not in front of it. He's not behind it. He's not off to the left or the right, but he's in the middle. It's so easy to read over that and yet miss its significance. Later, John tells us that the seven candlesticks represent the church. The seven communities that appear in this text and that being historical churches, number seven represents completeness, the totality of churches, in other words. And so in any place, in any era of the last 2,000 years, they have existed or will exist. In other words, Jesus is always in the midst of his church. A little bit of symbolism and revelation has a mighty powerful meaning. And today we celebrate the lordship of Jesus at the center of our church. As Jesus said, I will build my church. You know, the Lord symbolically has always been in the middle of his people. When the ancient Israelites left Egypt, God ordered that the tabernacle be built. And the way it was built, it was in a place where 
People could always see it from wherever they were in the church camp on their journey to the promised land. And brothers and sisters, God has made a deliberate intention to be in the midst of us. And you read the culmination at the end of Revelation where God now dwells with man and man with God. It's very powerful. And even though human history and the biblical narrative shows humanity turning away from God and opting for sin, God's part of the covenant promise is always faithful. And so we see his grace despite the sinful condition of humanity. 2,000 years ago, God the Father manifested himself in Jesus Christ who came down from heaven, born of Mary by the Holy Spirit and became his son, whom we know and honour and celebrate and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are not alone. The Lord Jesus goes before us and he's in the midst of us. Now, regarding the vision that John's had regarding the Son of Man, it was spectacular. A vision that was so powerful and so strong that the glorified Christ was, as best as John could visualize, the purest style of the high priest in the old dispensation. Remember the priest used to dress up with a long robe and a turban and etc., but John describes Jesus then in this vision as his hair as white as snow, reflecting the holiness of the Lord, his eyes like a flame of fire, exhibiting purity. Out of his mouth, John saw went what he saw a symbolic two-edged sword. And the author presents that to us in imagery that might be familiar to us from reading of the Old Testament high priest role in the Old Testament. And so, as we enter the book of Revelation, this is extraordinary vision, we are invited to deeply appreciate the reminder that Jesus is Lord. He's our Lord, and he's preeminent lordship forever. And his intercessory work unites us with God and man. He brings us into God's presence. But the role of Jesus is also bringing God's presence down as a son of man, on a human level. So Christ is Lord. There's no other Lord. He is one with the Father, and he is the one who can unite us with the Father. How powerful and significant is this? Jesus is the same nature of the Father, the likeness of his Father, but he also shares the likeness and nature of you and I as human beings. And so he acts as in the Melchizedek order as the high priest and as supreme lord at the bosoms, bosom of the Father, he is seated at the right hand of our heavenly Father. For what reason? To accompany us, to intercede for us, to bless us, to protect us, to guide us. Jesus is in our midst and through Jesus our Father watches us we are sanctified, redeemed, justified. We are forgiven because Christ is in the midst between God the Father and us. The role of the high priest manifested Christ. So the motto for this year wasn't hard to determine, accompanied by Jesus. Yes, we are also accompanied by the brokenness of this world, sickness, pandemic, war, famine at the moment in Somalia and other places. And some of these things have been rarely seen in a generation. But we have God's word, brothers and sisters, that comforts us because he reminds us that we are not alone. The Lord accompanies us. And the one who accompanies us is at the right hand of the Father. The scripture says, when John saw all this and absorbed the intensity of this specific and spectacular vision, he fell, fell down as if he was dead. It was too much for the human psyche to comprehend. This happened also with Isaiah, who was given a similar vision in chapter 6 of a vision where he saw angels appear and he saw a glimpse into the heavenly and he says, Woe is me, for I am an unclean man with unclean lips. He recognized his total inadequacy. And on, you know, at that moment, John fainted 
Isaiah fainted. In other words, they experienced what they f- that the human can't comprehend. And to be in God's presence would be, you'd almost feel like you're on the threshold of dying. And what does John hear? What does Isaiah hear? Fear not. Don't be afraid. Many times you read through the scripture, don't be afraid, fear not. It's the Lord who tells us, do not fear, don't be afraid. That was the same message when Joshua stepped in the shoes of Moses. Don't be afraid, be of good courage, be of good cheer. And then the Lord gives us a reason why not to fear, because he repeats what he's already said. Don't fear, because I am the first and the last. This is all in my control. I am Lord. So what does this mean? Well, God and Christ are the origin and final destiny of all human destiny. That's why the author of Hebrews says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In the Lord's hands is all of human creation, narrative and history, particularly salvation history, and that pertains to you and me. Christ is the beginning of our salvation and the good work that he's done will be the culmination of salvation. He started it. He's beginning it. He's he's ending it. He's the Alpha. He's the Omega and nothing can prevent him from carrying out his holy purpose. That gives us extraordinary courage. Jesus says of the church that he's building, the gates of hell will not prevail against it because he is the one who sustains the history of salvation. Verse 18 says, Behold, I am alive. I was dead, but behold, I am alive forever and ever. Without doubt and uncertainty, the voice of Jesus, it's the resurrected Jesus speaking, brothers and sisters. He's the one who appears in the vision. He's not dead. The grave cannot contain the Lord. It took him because of your and my sin. Jesus was dead for three days and three nights according to the Old Testament prophecies. Just as Jonah was in the grave of the way, in the belly of the way, whale or the fish for three days and three nights, so said Jesus, the Son of Man, will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. But guess what? The Lord rose again. And you know, when the women were first to visit the tomb, they went to anoint the body of the Master, and they were astonished that their Lord was not there. What did the angel say? He looked at Mary and said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Brothers and sisters, that is the signature of all of the definitive promises that the Lord gives that they are true. Because of the power of having risen from the dead, so now Jesus Christ intercedes for us. And in that sense, Jesus is invincible unsurpassable. We describe him in these concrete expressions of omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. Can you comprehend the divine reality that we are called to believe by faith? Our Lord is over and above all things and he has everything that's been created. And one of the other symbols that come out of the resurrection, out of the book of Revelation, is that we should not fear also because he has the keys of hell and death. Now, keys are a symbol of authority, of ownership. In that sense, Christ is absolutely over all. Life, death, present, past and future. Absolute everything is under the dominion and the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we can have victory in this age. That's why John was told, don't be afraid. That's the message that comes to us today with the presence of Jesus. I have the keys of hell, that is of die grave and of death. Now, death is an enemy, but Jesus has the key. He's overcome that. He overcame death. And so likewise, you and I share in his victory. And that's what happens. In due time, one day we will die. Just recently, we lost Pastor Phil here in Australia. But one day... Jesus' voice will call the righteous from their grave and we will have overcome, just like Jesus rose from his grave. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. It also says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord Jesus. 
The second death has no power over them. That is an afforded victory that we believe by faith. There is a guarantee, brothers and sisters, of resurrection, and we give glory to God for that. He writes, The things that you have seen, and the things that are, and the things that are to be after this, as we read in the prophetic interpretation, the wholeness of God's word, you can see here, for example, that the stars represented in the vision are the leaders of the churches, of the congregations, the shepherds of the flock, and the lampstands are the seven churches. And we read, and, and, and Revelation interprets itself if we look at it and take it to heart. So for pastors, members, believers, this Entry part into the book of Revelation is primacy for the rest of the book. And we have the certainty that the Lord Jesus accompanies us. All through this journey, all through this circumstance, all through this narrative, all through different circumstances, no matter the time, the place, the history, past, present or future, Jesus accompanies his people all the time in all places and brothers and sisters in all circumstances. Our very brothers and sisters, on behalf of the International Ministerial Congress, we send you a warm hug with much affection. May God bless you. As we close, I also want to take the opportunity to share some updated news. In the International Ministerial Congress, we're working with various agendas and committees to finally hold the next Congress session in Nigeria in November 2023. By God's grace, we work towards that. And we have some well-equipped volunteer teams working out all the details for that. In order to prepare for that, I encourage all countries to send their delegates, a a representative and an alternative, so that we can have the Congress with the full participation of all member countries throughout the International Ministerial Congress of the Church of God's Seventh Day. God bless you, brothers and sisters. In the words of Ramon Ruiz, paz which in Spanish means peace. I'm in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm your brother, John Classic. <laughs>